Thank you, choir. Thank you, Anita. All right. Gospel of John. We don't want to try that video again, do we? <laughs> no. Don't worry about it. That's okay. I didn't know if you guys had a chance to reload. We've had some problems with the, the, with the Internet, you know, so it's not wanting to, I guess you saw it was stalling out. It wasn't wanting to run, so... We tried. We tried, didn't we? Appreciate you guys. We do. All right. John chapter 4. I want to speak to you this morning on the difference between curiosity and faith. The difference between curiosity and faith. And if you will, look in verse 43. After the two days, he departed from Galilee, or for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. 
So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an, office, an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And, he was, and as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. And he, so he asked them the, the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed and all of his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from the Judea to Galilee. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning and we first want to thank you for the precious word of God. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open the word to us and that, Lord, we might be, as Psalm 119 says, Lord, that we might behold wonderful things out of your word. Lord, give us uh, the uh, understanding of the Holy Spirit. We pray that the word of God might go forth and have free course and be glorified as we present it here today. Show us Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we think about uh, Christmas season and Advent, uh, we're moving uh, through this time, and so often uh, we have to guard against the sentimentality of it all, the, uh, you know, the nostalgia. We believers in Jesus can't afford to fall into that trap. But I, so I think it's wonderful that we're studying through the book of John as we move into the Advent season, season because it gives us such a great opportunity to see the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is. Instead of him being forced into the mold of you know, our commercialism and all of the trappings that sometimes surround Christmas. And so I think it's, a, it's uh, wonderful and I thank the Lord that we're able to do that. We see the living Christ moving and acting and being the Savior of the world right here in the Gospel of John rather than the caricature that oftentimes is given to us by the media. And so uh, I just want to throw that out there kind of as a commentary as I've thought and prepared this week and we're moving into Advent. I just want to say, you know, praise the Lord that we're able to celebrate the Savior as He truly is right here in the book of John. But as we think about this passage this morning, as we wrap up chapter 4, we really are moving into a different section. But, you know, as I've studied this passage, it occurs to me, too, that the Church of Jesus Christ, for some time now, uh, is in an unusual era. We've moved into a time in church history uh, when Christians, uh, on a, in great numbers, are concerned more with experience than with doctrine or with belief or with even faithfulness. We, of course, we live in an existential generation. It's all about experiences and climbing and, and rafting and your bucket list. And we all want to have uh, all of those experiences. I heard of someone recently that just drove to a monumental place in the United States. I believe, if I remember correctly, it may have even been uh, the, uh, the Grand Canyon. And, and just looked at it and, and kind of enjoyed it a little bit and then left. You know, and, and that, you know, we've all done things like that, haven't we? We've said, well, I've been here, you know, and that's, that's exciting. But then we didn't, really, we didn't really experience it, did we? Sometimes we do those things because we want to check off a bucket list. You know, well, I've been here, I've been there, you know, uh, and so forth. And we've all done that. How many states have I been in and so forth? How many countries have I been in? 
And, and that's really just, in many ways, it's, it, that is a barometer of our age when experience carries so much weight in the way we think, in the way we live our lives. I'm not saying it shouldn't have some weight, but we need to be careful that experience doesn't begin to be our faith. And I think that's what we run into in this passage. Myriads of people flock. Uh, it's turned into a mentality. Myriads of people flock from one church to another seeking uh, whatever is new, whatever is exciting, whatever wonders that that church might be putting on that week or that month or that year. Or, or churches are oftentimes treated like restaurants. You know how it goes. The newest restaurant with the most amazing cuisine and has the greatest chef and they just popped open everything and well, everybody wants to flock to that restaurant because we want to experience that. We want to see what's happening there. And oftentimes that mentality has also gone over into the uh, religious world where the newest church is the church we should go to. We should go experience the new, the exciting, and so forth. But is that really Christian? Is that really what the Bible teaches? It's developed into a philosophy where churches tend to uh, think of well, what are the newest things we can do. We have to keep the new machine going. You know, it's sort of like youth ministry used to be, and I think maybe youth ministry might be doing a little better these days, but years ago, youth ministry, it, it, the youth pastor had to just crank out something brand new every year. It, it wasn't about building and laying a foundation and then building on that foundation and then leading them to adulthood and, and to embrace the faith and move into, into being adults that love Christ and serve Christ, but it was more about keeping things exciting and, and fresh and brand new so that the kids would come back. And that is exciting, but is it biblical? Is that really what God calls us to? And I think we have a passage here that is so clearly dealing uh, with a situation like that. Secondly, as we move into this, uh, and more kind of introductory, as we move into this passage, we move into the section uh, in John where John is shifting. He's opening now a new theme. And the theme is, the theme of authority, the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. You're going to begin to see that there's a series of stories or accounts that John opens up, this is the first one, where he asks the question, what is our authority? And of course, he's going to answer that with the Word of God. And then the next thing he's going to say is, is the Word of God sufficient for you? Is that all you need to believe? It's God's Word. So you're going to begin to see this theme, this thread running through the next series of, of stories that, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the Apostle John has chosen. And in this passage, that's where we are moving the first one. And so let's think about that together. What role does God's Word play in our lives? And as we see that in this passage, you know, you've got a story that the Lord Jesus here, he, you remember, he has been at the well there and he has uh, shared himself as the Messiah with this woman and she believes and runs back into town and says, you know, I believe he could be the Christ. And many of those people uh, came to hear him and they said, we believe not only because of your word, but because also we have heard him ourselves. And they asked him to stay for two more days. And he agreed. And so now we are moving into the section. After the two days, he says in verse 30, 43, after the two days he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem for the, at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. Actually, it's very important. You might say those are just commentary about the movement of the Lord. You know, he's been there two days. Now it's time for him to move on to Galilee. And so we're just given this sort of, you know, map information. But that, that's not correct. 
there's a lot that's happening in these two verses that help us understand and even interpret what's really happening in the story that follows. So Jesus moves into Galilee, and as he moves into Galilee, uh, this man, an official, hears about it. And he walks, or rides an animal or whatever, but he makes his way uh, to Cana, where Jesus is. Uh, I'm from, sorry, to, to Canaan, from Capernaum, to meet with Jesus because his son is about to die. And so what's going on here? Well, let's back up for a second and set the stage as to why John gives us, in verse 43, uh, this information. We need to see that there's a, what a, might appear to some people a contradiction in the Bible here. He says, after the two days, he departed for Galilee. And here's a parenthesis. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So he came to Galilee. Now, if you were to go to the other gospel accounts, what we call the synoptic gospels, you'll find that that was the very reason Jesus left Galilee. It says that Jesus could not do miracles there because they did not believe him because a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And Galilee was his hometown. So Jesus left. John says he's leaving Samaria and he's going to Galilee because a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So it would appear at first glance that John is saying the opposite of what the other Gospels are saying. They're saying he left Galilee because he has no honor in his hometown. John is saying he's going to Galilee because he has no honor in his hometown. So what is the answer? Of course, God's Word is not contradicting itself, but it's all about understanding the message that's being communicated in John. The truth is, they're both correct. Jesus did leave Galilee because the prophet has no honor in his hometown. But Jesus also, it is correct to say, Jesus is also going back to Galilee because the prophet is, has no honor in his own hometown. James Montgomery Boyce said it this way, the explaining is simple, that at this point Jesus Christ moved his ministry to Galilee precisely because he had not been received in Galilee previously. And it was therefore the Galileans above everyone else who needed him. So in other words, Jesus is going back here because these people had rejected him. They had, put, they had not believed him. Of course, they knew him as a child. They understood who he was. They did not see him as the Messiah. And so he left because a prophet is without honor in his hometown. But now, as John says in verse, verse 43 and 40, 44, notice he says, So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Remember when he left, they did not welcome him. They were going to throw him over a cliff. Remember that? Because he read the prophet Isaiah and claimed to be the Messiah. And they got angry and they literally were pushing him to the edge of a cliff. And the Bible says he passed through them and went away. Now he comes to Galilee and it says, and they welcomed him. Why? And here's the key. Having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Oh, they saw the miracles. Time had passed, and they had been to Jerusalem. They had watched Jesus. They saw him produce the miracles. And now they were ready to hear him again. And so Jesus goes back. Now, what, what should we pull from that? Well, the first thing I'd like for us to think about in our Christian life that I think you and I should pull out of this is, number one, is that God uses faithfulness. God uses faithfulness. Jesus, in this passage, had been rejected. He had been pulled, pushed away. They did not see him as a prophet. They did not see him as the Messiah. 
And yet he went on about his ministry. He continued to do the work. And now, many of the Galileans were in Jerusalem at the feast. They saw the miracles of Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going back to Galilee. How many times have you and I tried to do work for the Lord and when something doesn't go right, we want to quit. We want to walk away. We want to forget instead of being faithful. The Lord Jesus could have easily not returned to Galilee. But look, God had been working in the Galileans. God had been preparing them for Christ to return. And He did return and came back to them. And now they were more ready to do and to hear the message of the gospel of Christ. They were more ready to consider that He might be the Messiah. In fact, I would say that some already believe that. But I will back up and say this, that they were also incredibly Curious. Curious. Many of these folks really just wanted to see the miracles up close and personal. Remember, this happened on other occasions. They said that myriads of people were following him and, and they wanted him to feed them. But then he turned to them and said... You know, if you don't forsake your father and your mother and your brothers and, and so forth for the kingdom of God, you're not worthy of me. And what did they do? They left. And Jesus looked at the disciples and said, will you also go away? And they had the words of genuine believers. They looked at the Lord Jesus and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's the heart of a true believer. Christ has the words of eternal life. Christ is the believer. They are clinging to Christ, not the miracles. And the Galileans here were incredibly curious. And, and, and you say, well, Scott, I don't know if that's true. Well, it is, and I'll tell you why. We'll see as we move into this. Because Jesus' response will, will divulge to us exactly what these, these people were thinking and why he said what he said to them. So the, but the first thing I want us to understand is that God uses faithfulness. You and I must be willing to stand with God. And oftentimes it looks like the winners are the, are the, are the people of the world. It looks like Satan's going to win. You know, on Wednesday nights we're studying the book of Psalms and how many times does David cry out to God because it looks like evil is winning and good is being destroyed, that God's kingdom is not going forward, and that God's people are only swallowed up in, in, in uh, persecution. And over and over, David gets his perspective back again when he realizes that God is in control, that this is the victory is the Lord's, that it is not up for grabs, and it is not in question in any way, shape, or form. And so you and I must always return to faithfulness to faithfulness and I, I can't I, I feel like I don't do a very good job of communicating that but I, I believe in our day one of the keys to fighting this this incredible gravitational pull of experience is to understand that experience really is not the main thing faithfulness is much more important much more important than that and this entertainment atmosphere is ruining and hurting the cause of Christ in many, many ways. And so believers, we must, we must rally to be faithful to God. And oftentimes the work of God will go forward and it will move forward and then be pushed back and then move forward and then push back and move forward and push back. And you see here an example of how the Lord Jesus responded to that. He came back to Galilee. What should you and I do? What, is there somebody that you're sharing the gospel with? Some Sunday school class or, or some ministry that you're working on? What do you do? Well, of course you seek the Lord. But if you know the Lord's called you to that, you go back. 
You go back. You hold the line. You do the things that God has called you and I to do. That's what He calls us to do, to be faithful. God uses faithfulness. And it is a trademark of Christians. It's not just familiarity that we say, Oh, come, all you faithful. We just sang that a little bit ago. Does that mean that's just the person, or those, you know, oh, come all those people that always show up to work? Is that what that's talking about? No. That's a gospel faithfulness. This is, these are the people, that song is are singing about people that believe in Jesus Christ and that it, despite the unbelief and the evilness of this world, we hold to the promises of Christ no matter what. We are faithful to God. That's what that song is talking about. That is the theology of the Bible. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. Number two, and this is really connected to number one, God uses His Word. God uses His Word. Look at this passage. Let's look, examine it a little closer and see what, how Jesus responds It says, so, in verse 26, so he came again to Cana in Galilee. Cana in Galilee. Remember where, what happened in Cana? That was when Jesus turned the water into wine at the marriage feast. That was, if you remember, the first miracle that Jesus did, the first public miracle of his ministry, of his public ministry, where he had made the water into wine, and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You see, Jesus' response divulges exactly what's happening here. This is not the the response that you and I would have expected if this was just a benign story when when Jesus says, uh, you know, a man comes up to Jesus and says, would you heal my son? Jesus could have easily looked at him and said, you know, go your way, your son is well. But he didn't. He prefaced that with another statement. You will not believe unless you see signs and wonders. What was Jesus saying? It was a rebuke. It was a rebuke to the man. It was a rebuke uh, to the people, to the crowd in Galilee. The people, the curiosity seekers. That's who he was speaking to. And notice that, you know, we need to understand that Jesus is saying to them, what's the foundation of faith? It's not experience. It's not miracles. It's not signs and wonders. The basis of our faith is the Word of God. The Word of God should be our our guide. It is what our faith is founded on. J.I. Packer said it this way, Only truth can be authoritative. Only an inerrant Bible can be used in the way that God means Scripture to be used. Only a Bible that is inerrant, only a Bible that is inspired of God and sufficient carries the authority of God. It is not a mistake that God opens the book of Genesis with creating the world by speaking. And it is not a mistake that John opens his gospel with the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. No, it is the Word of God that is the foundation of our faith. And it's the Word of God that God uses in the ministry of the church. And in your life and in my life, You and I need to make our lives word-centered. This is what Jesus was calling them away from. Notice the Galileans had had now heard of the miracles in verses 45 and 46. What changed their mind? Why are they now welcoming Jesus? Because they'd heard the miracles. And they wanted to see them up close and personal. In fact, they were expecting some miracles. When Jesus showed up, that's exactly what they wanted. That's why when this situation happened, Jesus used it immediately to rebuke the crowd and the official here in this passage. 
He used it as an opportunity to, to rebuke them about their desire. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That's not an affirmation. That's not a compliment. In fact, I read one commentator that says, Jesus does not, uh, does not disagree or does not pit the word against the miracles in this passage. I would agree with that only in the sense that the, the signs and miracles are significant. They are there to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Remember what he said when John the Baptist had the question. He said, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus said, go back and tell John, you know, the dead are raised, the lame are healed. You know, the works of the Messiah are done by me. In another place he says, if for nothing else, believe me for the works' sake. So yes, you're right, and, and I would agree that he's not pitting the miraculous works of God against the Word of God, but what he is calling them ab away from is a, is an, is a fascination uh, with miracles and signs and wonders that is drawing them away from the truth of God. He's calling them to a solid faith based upon the Word of God rather than just on experience. The Apostle Peter says that in his epistle. He says, listen, we were all, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, we were all on the holy mount. We saw the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus. We saw the cloud settle in. We heard the voice that said, this is my beloved Son, hear Him. And then what did, the, did Peter say? He said, but beloved, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed. And what is that? The word of God. Christianity cannot be based on, on my experiences or your experiences. It is based upon the truth of God's word the timeless truth of God's Word. Dr. Rob Renow, he says, the church faces a new battle in the 21st century. The battle in many Christian churches today is not, is the Bible true? But it is, is the Bible enough? Is the Bible enough? And I would submit to you, the Bible is enough. There are often times when we don't get a miracle. And even in the Old Testament, when we tend to think that the Old Testament is filled with miracles after miracle after miracle, we need to understand if we study the history and the timeline, many times there were hundreds of years between one of these miracles and another miracle. And there's 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the, and the beginning of the New Testament. No, God's people are most of the time called upon to believe God's Word when there are no miracles and there are no unusual signs to prove that they are correct. They just must simply believe the Word of God. Is God capable of doing miracles? Absolutely. Does God do miracles? Absolutely. But God is sovereign and His miracles are performed when they fit His kingdom plan. Not for my convenience or to prop up my faith. He calls you and me to believe His Word. To take Him at His Word. Not to be constantly proving Himself to us. Which is what Satan wanted our Lord Jesus to do there at the temptation. He said, cast yourself off this pinnacle. You know God will save you. Turn this bread, this, these rocks into bread. And what did Jesus do all three times he was tempted? It is written. It is written. It is written. And beloved, you and I must understand that the main thing is, it is written. What is written is what matters. And that's what Jesus was saying to these people. That's what he was saying to this man. He was saying to them that it's the word of God is what you need to believe. The Word of God is what you need to face your, place your faith in. We do not know that the experiences are always this or that, but we do know what God's Word is true and that God will keep His Word. That's the truth. God will keep His Word. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy. Keep your finger in, in John. 2 Timothy. 
chapter 3. The Apostle Paul warns, the, warns Timothy that there will come a time when the world will, will turn. In fact, it was already there, but he's saying it'll even get worse, Timothy. You think it's bad in the Roman Empire. It's going to get worse, Timothy. And in those times, Timothy, young pastor Timothy, what do you need to do? Well, he tells him. He says, but in, understand this, in verse 1, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, un heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture wicked, weak women, burdened with sins and led, led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupt in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for they, their folly will be plain to all, as was that of the two, these two men. But you, Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my con conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, Iconium and at Lystra, where persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings." which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete or the woman of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped in every good work. You can go back to John. You see, beloved, it's the Word of God. It is the Word of God that, is, that God uses and if you remember, we talked when I first came, we talked about our core values, and I said, you know, the sufficiency of Scripture was one of the core values that I'd like to bring to our church. Not that you guys don't already believe the Bible. I'm just saying I like to unpack that. I like to accentuate that. I, help, I want to draw us to that. I want us to grow into that so that God will work in it. Why? Because of this very truth right here. Because God works through His Word. And God honors His message. Again, J.I. Packer says, Jesus Christ constituted Christianity a religion of biblical authority. A religion of biblical authority. Christianity comes from the Bible. And anything else is a fraud. And so you and I have to center on the Word. And that's what Jesus is saying to this man and to this crowd. You will not believe unless you see signs and miracles. He's calling them out of that. Move past curiosity. Move to faith. Move to believing. And third, God tests our faith in His Word. God tests our faith in His Word. Look at verse 47. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Notice, Jesus just said, you won't, you won't believe unless you see signs and miracles. And man's like he didn't even hear him. He's like, you got to come or my child's going to die. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. What did Jesus just do? He just demonstrated the power of the Word of God. Jesus didn't come. Remember what the, see what the man's doing? 
You can almost picture the man saying, taking Jesus by the hand and saying, you know, come, my son's going to die. You've got to come with me. Come on, come on. And Jesus said, go. Your son will live. What's Jesus doing here? He's showing this man, I don't need to come there. I can speak the word of God and your son will live. Which is the very reason why it says that as he was coming down, his servants came up to him and said, Master, your son is getting better. And they said, he said, what hour did my son begin to get better? And he said he saw that it was the very hour that Jesus said, go, your son will live. See, the point of this passage is honestly not the miracle. Now, Jesus is doing a miracle and proving that he is the Son of God. But the point of this passage here is really, Galileans, don't just be curious over wonders and signs. Galileans, believe the Word. Believe the Word. The Word of God carries the authority. God works through His Word and He tests us. He tests our belief in the Word. And that's what's happening here. He's testing the Galileans. He's testing this official. Now, I'll be honest with you. I believe the official passed the test. I believe he passed the test. In fact, I believe his faith grew as a result of this, this situation. He says uh, there in verse 50, Jesus said, Go, your son will live. Then the man believed the Word. Did you see that? The man believed. Yes, he, he was not sure at first. He's panicking. His son's dying. Jesus speaks. And the man turns and goes his way. He believed. And then he found out that his son was getting better. And then it goes on to say uh, in verse 50, um, 53... The father knew that this was the hour what Jesus had said to him, your son will live, and he himself believed and all of those in his household. So the man clearly passed the test. He believed. In fact, the Bible even, he, I think he had a measure of faith when he even came. This is probably, scholars say, between 16 and 25 miles it took for this man to get to Jesus from Capernaum to Cana. It took a lot of faith to come. Uh, but, you know, he still wasn't seeing things properly. And Jesus calls him to belief in the Word. He responds in faith to the Word. Whether the, the, the Galileans did or not remains to be seen. Some probably did. And some probably did not. Remember the story in the Old Testament about Naaman, the Syrian, the leper? And he came to the prophet and the prophet said, prophet said, I want you to go wash in the Jordan River. And the man said, all the great rivers in Syria, and you want me to go wash in that muddy Jordan River? No thanks. And he got on his caravan and starts going back. And a servant said, Master, what does it hurt? Would it hurt you to, to go in the River Jordan and duck, duck yourself? Would it, would it hurt and so the man said, okay, I'll do it. And he got in the river, and he dug down, and God healed him of his leprosy. And what was the point? Obedience to the word of God. The prophet had told him what to do. Would he obey? Would he obey out of faith? You see, it's not really about the miracle. It's about the word of God. And so, what would, what would you and I need to pull out of this? Well, I think we need to understand that God uses faithfulness, and He uses His Word. And when you put those two together, it means that God uses faithfulness to His Word. You and I, as believers in a 21st century, need to understand that we are where Timothy is talking about, where Paul told Timothy, what should we do? We should hold to God's Word. It is biblical authority. It is enough. It is sufficient. It is power. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
And so, have you ever been a, a, word, a wonder seeker or a person that's looking for an experience over God's Word? We've all probably done that. But God's Word calls us to found our faith on the Word of God. So will you trust His Word? Will you make His Word the foundation of your belief? God will honor it in your life if you do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your, your word. We ask that you would help us to understand it. Lord, help us to prioritize it, to study it, to read it, to meditate on its pages and its truths, to pray over it, and allow it to shape us and mold us. Father, we know that as we trust your word, you will do great and wonderful things in our midst. And not only in our midst, but in our own lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us the strength to, uh, Lord, to resist the temptation of our age. To be more curiosity seekers than word followers. Help us, Father, to be word followers. To be shaped and molded as David was in Psalm 119. Lord, to be those people as you prayed, Lord Jesus, in John chapter 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Father, help us to be those people. Give us faith and faithfulness to go through the testings when we trust your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You will.